now have our second panelist, who's Tom Heiser from EMC, who will share with us the vendor's perspective. Thank you, Paul. Great job, Corey. Uh, it's nice to see the uh, different perspective on this. We've been, you, you might be asking, why is EMC here? If you, those of you who are familiar with EMC, it's a storage company. So you're saying, okay, why is EMC here talking about compliance and the regulated markets and such? And it really started about three years ago or so with the launch of the, uh, the product that I run, this Intera product. And about 30 months or so ago, we started working directly with the SEC. And we started working with a lot of the broker dealers also, a lot of the investment banks. And, uh, it, and I have seen a big shift in the, in the attitude of the investment banks, of the broker dealers out there. When we started going out, one of the very largest investment banks in uh, downtown Manhattan, I sat down with a uh, high-level executive, and we were talking about compliance. And there was an air of, um, of an arrogance uh, with this, as there, as there usually is with the investment banks. But there was an air of arrogance with this person that said, well, we used to be compliant. We were running all of our uh, uh, broker-dealer content on Optical, but it became too uh, difficult to manage, so we're not running in a compliance uh, mode anymore. And I thought that was interesting, that uh, he was obviously not very concerned about what the SEC thought. But that has changed a lot over the past three years. And I do think that the new uh, leadership within the SEC has changed things. Uh, we have uh, certainly um, been in the right spot with this product to uh, clearly capitalize on it. But uh, we've also listened to the user community. We've listened to the SEC and have modified the product a lot. I have Sean Lanigan here with me who runs uh, my product management group. And he was uh, started the, uh, the compliance effort for EMC about uh, two and a half years ago or so. And um, within that period of time, we've modified the product quite a bit, come out with new features. I'm going to let you guys in. Don't, don't tell anybody, but on May, March 1st, we have a, uh, we're uh, announcing some new feature function, and it is directly in uh, the sweet spot of this. We have uh, new search capabilities built within our product that will help uh, users be able to extract uh, the content from the product. Uh, we're actually changing the names of our products. We have a, a product called Compliance Edition and Compliance Edition Plus. Compliance Edition Plus was purpose-built for SEC 17A4 broker-dealer. Uh, Compliance Edition, actually, we list, we listen to the user community, and we're changing the name to Governance Edition. Same feature function, but what it does is it broadens the scope of the use or the applicability of the product. We, we found a lot of customers buying this product, using it outside of compliance spaces uh, for good corporate governance, Sarbanes-Oxley and such. So we're, we're we're constantly listening and, and changing that space. So uh, hopefully we can share with you some of the examples of, of this. So, you know, uh, the SEC is obviously the, the, we call it, internally we call it the gold standard SEC 17A4 because it has the most defined, uh, defined regulations from EMC's perspective uh, for storage. But there is a, a ton of other regulations right now. Obviously you guys know about Sarbanes-Oxley. I have to sign off every quarter being an officer of EMC. I have to sign off on Sarbanes-Oxley that, that says uh, that I, I'm authorizing to, to the best of my knowledge that everything is factual and, and there hasn't been any improprieties uh, within that space. Uh, in Europe now, Basel II is uh, becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, in the healthcare space, HIPAA, uh, that's all about uh, patient um, privacy and such. The, uh, in the uh, pharma space, uh, it's called 21 CFR Part 11. That's a big one. So you can see there's a whole bunch of different regulations that, uh, that, that every industry at all levels are being, uh, are, are being uh, required to adhere to as well. Two things are happening that are uh, really coming together that's creating a tremendous opportunity for us, uh, those that are trying to solve this, but also uh, just a huge uh, headache for the, uh, the users. Number one is uh, more and more and tighter regulations. Uh, because what's gone on, uh, we're seeing more regulations, better definition around those regulations, better enforcement of those regulations. But also is just this massive, massive growth of information. Uh, being a storage company, uh, we like the exabytes, that's good. Centera has uh, sold over 40 petabytes of information already in, in less than three years. So it's a big chunk, but uh, that's goodness. So trying to manage this massive amount of information, layering on top uh, these the, the more regulations, 
uh, it creates a uh, big collision in the middle for the operations for the, uh, the end users in this space. If you take a look at it, higher, uh, more compliance obligations, inadvertent destruction of this, not having policies, or if having policies, not adhering to the corporate policies, uh, and then just massive growth of information. So if you take a look at the uh, records management right now, uh, most companies surveyed do not have a good records management policy within, within their uh, corporations. And if they do, they're not adhered to. So if you take a look at what is going on today right now through this list, the first one is who doesn't keep everything? You keep, I keep all the emails. I have, you know, thankfully EMC lets me have an unlimited box, which is unusual. But uh, just massive amount, thousands and thousands of emails, and you can archive the old ones too. Who doesn't try to keep everything that you have? So it, it just becomes crazy to manage. And if you try to search that content from a corporation standpoint, it becomes impossible. Trying to go back to Iron Mountain. A good friend of mine is a president in Iron Mountain. It's a great business model, right? Who gets rid of the content once it's stored? It goes off into the salt mines or in the warehouses, and it lasts there forever and ever. But trying to retrieve that content is unbelievable. Even if it's on, even if it is digitized, even if it's on optical or if it's on magnetic media. I have a company right now trying to retrieve some old documents. It's going on right now. The first, and they, these were put on tape, and the tape was brought off site. The first estimate for that was a quarter of a million dollars to try to retrieve some content of, of tape that was that was in an offsite. The new estimates are a half a million to a million dollars of just trying to retrieve this content let alone how long it takes to get that information, the massive amount of, of labor and cost is tremendous. The third one is each one of these regulations are being handled in a very siloed fashion, whether I went through the different types of regulations that are out there, and each one is being handled by a different group, different application area. A lot of it is being based on obsolete hardware. So if you think of optical, who here uh, owns an MP3 player or an uh, iPod? Show me your hand. Wow. All right, I'm going, I have three kids. I'm going on my third iPod right now. So it's totally, totally disruptive to uh, the CD world. I have the same six CDs in my six pack in my car that I've had in for a year and a half, and I never listened to it because who's got the time to change that? iPod is totally disrupting that. And it's the same thing with what we're doing here, because we're providing easy means of access to this online content. So if you take a look at the optical jukeboxes, They've had something like six different format changes in the past seven years. We have two customers right now that are going into a salvage yard trying to find an optical device to run the, um, an, optical dry, or an optical platter that they used to have five or so years ago. Now, I've been around for a while, and I used to have my first uh, recording medium was eight tracks, right? So I have some good, good eight tracks still. But trying to find an A-track or even a record player to, to record it on is crazy. But that's, that's apply that to what's happening right now in the user community, and that is absolutely happening. You go back to Iron Mountain, you can pull out the optical drives, but then what do you run it on? Nobody has online the, uh, the systems to be able to, to retrieve that content. Deterioration of the content. It's estimated that approximately 15% of all tape media degrades the point of not being functional within its useful life. So the SEC calls, or Elliot Spitzer calls, and they said, hey, I need you to do a search on these key words. Great. They go back and say, sorry, the media is degraded. I, I can no longer read it. Is that valid? Do you think they care about that? I don't, I don't think they care about that. That's, that's their problem, right? But it happens all the time. So what are some of the best practices right now that are going on? Right now, it's uh, maintaining the records according to a published plan, documented plan, that meets the regulations, whatever regulation you're, you're having, happen to, to have uh, being governed by, whether it's HIPAA or whatever, and deleting it when you can. So that's one of the keys to this is retention and deletion should be part of the policy. And that's one of the things companies are grappling with is, is keeping it for 30 years or keeping it for the defined period of time, whether it's three years or whatever it happens to be. The second one is it has to be online. One of the dynamics we're seeing now with, in the storage industry is it's a very elastic market. So as, as the costs have come down, 
what's gone on? More and more content is kept online. So when we introduced this product, people were keeping online information online or information online for three months, and then they'd dump it off the tape, and then it'd go off to Iron Mountain. Right now what we're seeing is a window, an expansion, a, a very large expansion of keeping this information at a keystroke. Because if it's not there on a keystroke, it's not going to be used. It has to be readily available with highest integrity. We talked about the siloed, having a policy that spans the entire company, uh, storage system, uh, sorry, obsolescence of, of hardware, having storing content that it doesn't make any difference what the media is if you're just storing an object, an email or, or a record or whatever it happens to be. Who cares what the, the media is as long as you, you have it in a standards-based fashion that you can access that content. And then also providing the means to uh, survive uh, different versioning and formats. So we think about compliance, we usually jump to the third one, technology. And technology is a big part of this. We have policies uh, within or, or, or software functionality within Centera that provides the ability to manage these policies. And uh, that, that's very good and, and uh, the, one of the reasons why it's been embraced so much by the broker-dealer community uh, is because it makes their lives easy. We manage a lot of that content for them. We, we pull out the management cap uh, requirements from the end user standpoint. But it also requires training of people, knowledgeable people, and processes that, are, that go all hand in hand with the application to provide a total compliance solution. So it isn't just based on technology. So here's, uh, Paul, you asked for a little ILM, I think, here. So here's uh, my ILM slide. Who, who knows what ILM is? Quick, don't look at the slide. All right. So information lifecycle management. It's kind of an industry term right now. And what it basically talks to is putting the appropriate information or, or a specific type of information on the appropriate medium. So the, the traditional way that I've talked about is if you think about it being kept on a uh, SAN for highly transactional information, and then, so that's a storage area network. On uh, NAS, which is a network attached storage for collaborative uh, types of information, kept offline on optical, ultimately dumped off the tape, and sent off site. That's a very traditional uh, look at the information lifecycle management. Now, what EMC is trying to do is we're trying to layer on top of this the software that makes the management of this easier rather than complicating users' lives. So you have too many different platforms with too little functionality. What, what the content address storage does, it's made for enterprise archiving, and it really spans across all of those. So if you think about it, if it was kept offline, now you can keep it online, is how I, how I said. But it's also a very economical uh, means of storing information. And what you can do now is cut into some of the online content early on and, uh, and cost justify the rest of it by putting that content that was transactional that became archived, now you put it on this uh, content address storage and it's a le it costs a lot less to both uh, it, uh, to buy it as well as to operate the content. This is uh, one slide that kind of summarizes typical uh, functionality without actually saying the actual name of the product. So think of storing this type of archive content. Think of it as a filing cabinet. And, store, and think of it as a filing cabinet that never fills up. The intelligence within it allows you to store only one copy. Think of an email attachment. How many people have the same attachment if uh, the Carroll School sends you something and it has an attachment? Everybody here that, uh, that goes to the Carroll School has that attachment. What content address storage does is it only stores it once. And it has pointers from all the different users to that content. When there's no longer any pointers to that content, that content can be deleted. So you say, why the heck would a storage company want that? Because this is the wave of the future. It's all managed through the software. 70% of my business is software, even though we're thought, thought of as a traditional hardware company. It self-manages and self-heals. Takes the operators out of that. Industry norms are, in a network-attached storage environment, you have one FTE, or full-time equivalent, 
per 10 to 15 terabytes to manage because of the file systems and such. With content address storage, you have one per 300 terabytes of storage. The system manages it itself. I had one user, uh, a broker dealer in Toronto, who was actually Bank of Montreal, and uh, they said they no longer knew where Centera was, and they didn't know how to manage it because it went in and it was a black box, and they forgot about the box where it was and how to manage it. The ability to replicate remotely, whether it's from Paris to uh, Japan or wherever it happens to be, from, from uh, Chestnut Hill to Hockington, you have the means over IP to remotely uh, store this uh, a secondary copy, which is very important in the regulated uh, markets. You never lose anything until that specified date, but that, uh, so you have retention uh, capabilities on that, uh, timestamps. But when that date comes, you have the ability to delete that content. Can't be broken into, complies with regulatory needs, finds it where you want it, when you want it, wherever you need it. And uh, finally, it checks the integrity of the data of that content. So you know bit for bit what goes in is exactly what comes out. And without getting too technical, we run a hash across the content so we know that when we retrieve that content, as long as the hash is the same, what went in is exactly what get, comes out. So it has the highest data integrity in the industry. So without saying that, that's the summary of what the product uh, is, what the product's functionality provides, and it uniquely provides it to the marketplace. And now we pull this back to the SEC. SEC 1784 is the uh, broker dealer uh, requirement uh, that you guys heard about. And if you take a look at uh, each one of these, this is the media requirements under uh, 1784. Number one is uh, preserves a record exclusively in a non-rewritable, non-erasable format. What is that synonymous with? What's the acronym? WORM, thank you. WORM functionality, write once, read many. So an optical disk, WORM. But now what we're doing is we're doing it through software. Going back to the iPod example, we're managing it through the software. If you look at the titles of those regulations, this is what I mean about us having a lot of lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Number two is uh, verifies automatically the quality and accuracy of the storage media. That's the bit for, for bit integrity. What goes in is what comes out. Number three, serializes, uh, has a time, date, and retention. I talked about that. Each, each uh, email or whatever will have a time stamp to that. And after seven years or whatever the period of time is, you can delete that at that point. And then finally, um, you can download that content to any, any form, any other medium that you want, paper, whatever it happens to be, for use in the court or wherever it is. So if we take a look at uh, some use cases of this, this happens to be a broker dealer in the Southeast uh, United States. Uh, they had an uh, inquiry uh, by the SEC uh, to search for 19 key words. And uh, probably had to do with uh, different trades and uh, looking for people that uh, were involved in the, or companies that were involved in the trade. And uh, the SEC, they had promised uh, to provide the content within four weeks. After five weeks, there was, no, uh, there was nothing provided by the broker dealer and uh, we were called in. Now th this is uh, off an optical jukebox, and you think is, okay, well it has high data integrity, but once again, the search was so slow, it didn't have the intelligence built in to search off those key words that they couldn't comply with the requirements in that space. Uh, I think the SEC is, one of the things that I found is, is that they are concerned about the ability for broker dealers to be able to invest in this space, but when they ask for it, they expect to be able to get it. So ultimately, uh, Centero was brought in. We were brought in with an email archiving uh, application, and uh, and the uh, the the retention uh, time or the uh, retrieval time came down from months into uh, literally minutes, or even potentially seconds to retrieve some of the uh, initial content. Insurance companies. Elliot Spitzer has helped us out in this regard. If you guys have been uh, reading the Wall Street Journal, this is uh, the new frontier uh, by Elliot, and uh, we've uh, certainly been there and uh, trying to help the uh, user community with this as well. But uh, same type of thing is going on. This happens to be a, uh, a large insurance company here in New England, and uh, once again, massive uh, problems with uh, the retention uh, or the uh, retrieval of content. 
the, the online system was so important uh, and it was based on optical that uh, it was estimated, they estimated that uh, an hour of downtime would have cost the company $5 million because it was an online system that they needed to have uh, available the content uh, on a continual basis, 24 by 7. And once again, uh, the Sentara uh, product was very disruptive to the uh, uh, existing technologies that was there. One of the things that was uh, mentioned by Corey was the, the admissibility of the content, I believe, is one of the things uh, he had talked about. And here's uh, this, sorry about the, uh, the copy on this, but this is uh, Southern California a High Tech uh, uh, Task Force. What this is, is uh, basically LA County's uh, Police Department. What they do is if they're, uh, when they go into um, uh, a, 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 a extract um, PCs, when they go into a, a crime scene, what they'll do is uh, take, uh, confiscate the PCs, download all the content on the PCs and onto a Sentara. And then the admissibility, then the, they use the content off the Sentara as admissibility into the court. So it has been proven uh, in, the, in the court environment to be able to, uh, to be used for admissibility purposes. So as you guys uh, are graduating from the uh, Carroll School, I'm sure in one way or another, you're going to have exposure to the uh, regulated environments, uh, whether it's uh, corporate governance or tightly regulated markets. And these are some of the questions I'm sure you guys are going to be facing as, uh, as you go out there. You know, the first one is, does your uh, current archive media strategy expose your firm to unnecessary discovery risks? There's a lot of uh, uh, risk out there with that. Can your business afford to wait days, weeks, months to retrieve that content? And uh, most of the regula uh, regulatory bodies uh, are not willing to wait that long. Will this uh, system be available to read that content off of that media in five years? Are, you dis uh, are your disclosure and reporting processes costly and uh, inefficient, ineffective, inefficient? Does your organization have established records archiving method? And so on and so forth. So see, these are some of the questions that uh, I'm sure you guys are going to face as, uh, as you leave the uh, Carroll School. So with that, I think that's my last slide. Um, I think we'll be uh, ready for some uh, Q&A here. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So now I'd like to invite our other <coughs> panelist, Corey Booth, to perhaps come up on front with Sean. Why not? Yeah, I, I invited Sean to come up because uh, he's got a tremendous amount of hands-on experience in the uh, compliance space. And also uh, Steve Bolana from State Street Global Advisors, who uh, in Ron Stroud's absence might be able to handle some questions pertaining to some compliance issues within State Street. We have a microphone here on the right hand side of the room, so if any of you are on the right hand side and you want to approach the microphone, then by all means, feel free. Do we have a roving microphone? I guess if we don't have a, right, a roving microphone, if you do want to ask a question, just shout real loud. That'll work. Okay, well, let's open it up to the floor. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes, sir. about compliance issues. That's, that's the first and foremost thing. Um, the, the idea is that you know, we are going to be spending more time looking at people who seem to be doing less themselves. Um, we have an obligation to go to every company on a, you know, on a, on a, on a you know, kind of normal scheduled basis in order to, make, in order to look for, uh, for compliance issues and, and see whether or not things are going okay. Um, what we want to put in place is a system whereby people who are more honest with us are visited less and perhaps less intrusively uh, than people who, who don't tell us as much. Now, frankly, what we're still trying to work on are some of the rules around this. I mean, is there some kind of a privileged relationship here where if you tell us something, we, we are basically exempting you from, from ever having that used against you? 
I'm not sure we're quite ready to make that kind of pronouncement yet, but that's the kind of thing we're currently wrestling with as we try to put this kind of relationship together. Okay. I was just going to make one comment, so or a question to the audience. Trust is a big implication in what you talked about, and as you think about in your role, sort of the business and the systems and the legal folks all coming together, they're the ones that are involved in responding to these. Does anybody in the audience have a feeling for what happens when one of these inquiries comes in today? No. Just to sort of take the, the example of that, that uh, firm down in, in the southeast. They wanted to reply and respond as quickly as they could to what the SEC asked for. What happened was, and this is where sort of organizational dysfunction gets in the way, the lawyers at that firm and the compliance folks dealt with the regulators. The regulators came down and said, we'd like this content. Those folks weren't very well plugged into the IT and line of business people who knew what it would take to retrieve all the information and records that were being asked for. And so the lawyers, on their, with the best intentions in the world, tried to commit to the SEC how quickly they could get the content back. Then those folks turned around and walked over to the systems and the line of business people and said, well, we've got four weeks, and they need these all the emails from all of our brokers that have any of these 19 keywords in the last three years. And so that sends the systems people scurrying, saying, do you understand First of all, I only have data from the last year on disk. Then the year before that, it's on optical platters, and I and I you know I can't reliably get them. And after that, they're in boxes. And by the way, if we misspell any of those words when we're looking, you know, uh, uh, from a, a recall point of view, we have to start this whole process over. And so it's that kind of dysfunction that happens. And what the regulators see is someone not responding. You know, and the data doesn't come back after four weeks. And so that gets to why that trust and transparency, transparency is so important for, for the SEC to see that people are trying to satisfy this. It's also coordination within, an, within a business. So this is non-technology, non-sort um, uh, non of uh, nuts and bolts accounting. It's you got to make sure you're coordinating with the different constituencies inside your businesses when you get in trouble. Chris? Questions from Mr. Booth. You, you alluded briefly to some of the frauds and scandals we've all read about in the past couple of years. Some of those frauds seem to exist for quite a while before the SEC was able to investigate them. I know you've only been at the SEC for a year, but what's your view on whether some of those frauds, could they not have been uh, exposed or investigated earlier? Doesn't the fact that Elliot Spitzer is prosecuting so uh, vigorously suggest that as well? And if you think so, was that a technology, a technology problem? Well, I think there were a bunch of different questions there. Uh, so, so, so let me see if I can break it down. Um, uh, you know, for, first, firstly, I think that that uh, let me start with Spitzer. Um, if if you think about the kinds of things that he's been going after in terms of the the research analysts, in terms of the the insurance brokerages, uh, and some of the other things that he's been that he's been kind of really really whacking at, those are all the kinds of things that are almost certainly extremely endemic to the way that these industries work, right? These are built on what I was talking about when I was talking about standard industry practice. There is no question that these things were going on for years, even decades, um, and, and, and no one really sought to question it because everyone just kind of said, this is how business is done. What's required, I think, in, in terms of catching some of those kinds of things is really a fresh perspective and a sense of aggressiveness that I think was not in place either in our office or in the New York District or in the New York Attorney General's office uh, five years ago, and so and so that I think is more of a cultural change and attitudinal change. Now, in terms of some of these other ones, so for instance, if you think about Enron, if you think about Global Crossing, um, maybe Hollinger, some of these ones that are that are really more about a case of a small group of bad actors is it, maybe a good way to characterize those. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can that you can apply hindsight to these kinds of situations, but what I would like to think is that through a combination of of systematizing the way we review companies and by being more conscious of, of what constitutes red flags and yellow flags with these companies and applying technology in order to do that, both both the flagging as well as the review, 
that we can catch some of these situations earlier, even if they are, you know, essentially essentially a single instance of a bad apple. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Do you think that, do you have any view on the role of uh, Harvey Pitt when he was the SEC chair? Do you think he uh, may have not prosecuted some of these frauds as alertly as perhaps Chairman Donaldson would have? I'm not sure I'm a good person to comment on that one just because I wasn't here when, when Chairman Pitt was around. I mean, you know, my sense was he was dealing with his own issues associated with, with uh, the fact that these accounting scandals were breaking over the bow uh, and, and some of this stuff was, was really brand new for us. Um, I think that, uh, that uh, you know, one of the things that, that Chairman Donaldson was actually able to do is be the guy who, who was able to be the sheriff who came in to clean up the town as opposed to Harvey, who essentially had some of these things done on his watch. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know Chairman Pitt personally, and I've never met him, and, and you hear lots of stories in lots of different directions about him, so, so I, but I really don't have any strong perspective on him. Thank you. Guido? Um, what I, I guess what I would say is there, there's no question that, that you can do amazing things with technology with respect to a lot of the things that happen in securities markets. And, and traditionally what we have tried to do at the SEC has been reasonably agnostic with regards to these, these innovations. So, so basically saying something to the effect of, of, you know, we don't care whether you use new methods or old methods as long as you follow these basic guidelines. Now, in some cases, that works. In some cases, we can't afford to do that. So, for instance, uh, if we think about 1784, which these guys were talking about, clearly those are specific technical implications behind them. By the way, you couldn't have been able to implement those rules not many years ago. So, you know, that required us to understand the technology and to basically formulate rules around it. Another example of that, which, which I think you specifically alluded to, is IPOs, right. And so, um, there's a proposed rule right now which, which internally we're calling Securities Act reform. Uh, which essentially has to do with the idea that we want to be able to allow people to do internet roadshows uh, and other kinds of things like that so that you can really leverage these, these you know, more mass communications vehicles in order to get out the kind of information you need to support an IPO. So it's basically saying, you know, the principles that, that were originally built into the IPO process around trying to provide the right kind of information for prospective investors are still valid. What we want to do is we want to relax certain ways in which those were implemented so that, you know, they, they really kind of address the current sets of possibilities out there. Yeah, we're worried about the principle, and then once the principle is established that, like, the rules and regulations behind it can, uh, can come uh, Right, right. It, but in all, in all these cases, what we try to do is be, we try to avoid being overly narrowly prescriptive. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we're never going to be able to move as fast as technology. And so, and so we want to make sure we're, we're, we're we, to the extent that we can, future-proofing the things that we do in, in this kind of an issue. Well, I've actually got a, a user-oriented question. Corporations' IT budgets have been coming under increasing pressure in recent years, largely because of the explosion within the, the internet space, and there's other issues also. So if I pick State Street as an example where technology is seen as being an innovative and strategic application, where is the IT dollars coming from that go into compliance? Is it coming out of the CIO's budget, or is it being spun off perhaps from the CFO's budget? Um, it's first and foremost, out of the CIO's budget. It's, 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 
uh, a cost of doing business. One of the one of the, the difficulties of the battles that we face on the technology side is because technology is an enabler in this space and it offers capabilities with products like Centura that uh, uh, because we can provide the functionality, it's seen as um, uh, it's seen as a uh, requirement or, or responsibility of IT to be able to do those things as opposed to solely on the business. So as of right now, it's, uh, it's, it's coming primarily out of the CIO. But it's not necessarily at the expense of other projects. Uh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it would be nice if we could just go back to the well and say we have some appliance issues uh, and we need a few more million dollars. Uh, it just, uh, Wishful thinking. Yes. Uh, so no, it actually is coming at the expense of others, but but it's it's again it's 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 seen as, as something that we need to do. One of the things that interests me most um, in, in the discussions today was this whole client doctor idea of, of trying to proactively look at compliance and try to see some upside. I mean, to to a great extent, right now on the IT side of the house, it's 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 a necessary evil that we need to do. And, and, uh, there is no upside to try to be proactive with it. I mean, if we, we don't go talk to the SEC or to, to uh, even internal auditing and compliance functions, uh, because you know the best we'll get out of it is is a, uh, a nice little thank you note. But, but the, the risk of having a full blown investigation, where if you pass it with flying colors, uh, you're really just given the the pat on the back. Well, well that's that, that's what was expected of you anyway. Uh, so there's there's no upside in this tremendous downside potential. It's almost reminiscent of Y2K. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if we can somehow work with 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 uh, uh, the SEC and, and other uh, regulatory bodies where there where there is some upside, where they say yes, these people really are uh, looking out for their clients' best interest. Some of the things like South 70 type audits, we would actually get. Uh, a, a rating on, on uh, how well you're doing with your internal control systems so that that would be able to be publicized to clients and to prospective clients and used as part of the decision making process on where they're going to take their business. And those, those they're, they're, at least we have some upside potential, but historically it's been almost all the inside. So I think, I think uh, if we can start moving in that other direction, that will help a great deal. And it will certainly help from a funding standpoint as well because they can so the business can see some upside. Well I, actually I've got a question for you for back on this. I mean I mean you guys are in a position where you're essentially providing back office functions for a lot of other financial institutions. Mm -hmm. I mean do you guys have a play here in terms of being able to offer services? Oh certainly. I mean it is the, the problem is is there aren't any outside of things like SAS 70 there aren't very good measurement systems other than again negative ones. Right. I mean you know, if, if, if the SEC came in to, to take a look at us and and did and said, geez, these people have all the control systems they should have in place. They're using products like EMC's products and everything's wonderful. They, they're in compliance. You wouldn't find it more than, you know, a small little um, paragraph on a, on a side corner of the Wall Street Journal on page 12. Right. Uh, if you came in and you found that, you know, the largest that one of the largest financial services uh, companies in the world has issues that you need to investigate further, it would be, you know, uh, it would be our nightmare. Right. And uh, so, so you know, that's the issue is, is, is that, again, it's expected that you're going to have 100% compliance to regulation. Anything short of that, that's what gets all the press. And so yeah. we need to turn that around if it's actually going to generate a business difference. Mm -hmm. There are services companies out there now trying to capitalize on this, and a couple come to mind are EDS and AT&T, and they're trying to provide these services for the regulated space. There's a perception that goes with that, though, and correct me if I'm wrong, that then their obligation to the regula regulatory body is then uh, eliminated. They no longer have to, mm -hmm. and, it, and the uh, responsibility then transfers to the service provider. I don't think we'd see it that way. I don't think we would. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Corey. Is uh, a couple of interesting areas right now are obviously mutual funds and the uh, and the uh, hedge fund area, and that's going to. So right now we're kind of in a gray area right now for this, right? I mean, the, the mutual fund seems to be ahead of the 
the, uh, the hedge funds that I'm in a hedge fund, I have no exposure to anything that goes on in that. I would like exposure to that, but that's one of their competitive advantages. So, I mean, how do you tackle that from, from your perspective in trying to uh, not only regulate that, but also manage some of the information that goes uh, into those uh, new burgeoning areas of, uh, of uh, regulation? Well, I mean, the, the uh, I think the mutual fund, I mean, the basic framework by which we deal with mutual funds is reasonably well established and it's been in place for a long time. I mean, these are, these are companies who file with us, who submit to examinations anyway. What we're trying to do is figure out ways of systematizing those things and, and, and applying risk management frameworks to them. Um, hedge funds are a different animal uh, because they are much more complex in terms of their structure and their investment portfolios and things like that. And, and a lot of what we said when we passed the hedge fund rules requiring them to register with us for the first time was essentially saying that this, this represents a risk to, a potential risk to the markets. Um, thinking about things like long-term capital management and some of the other hedge fund flows over the, over the past several years, that, that as, as regulators, we can't yet assess and quantify. And so a lot of what we're going to be trying to do over the course of the next few years in the hedge fund space is really trying to understand it better and trying to put in place at least an umbrella framework for being able to, to examine these things and look at these things, despite the fact that they have much more complex investment for, portfolios, they move much faster, and they cater to a different investor class. So, so in a lot of cases, what we're, we're essentially kicking off an investigative phase at this point to really try to, 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 really try to get a handle on what a, a, a beneficial way of regulating that industry would be. Kristen? I think there's been a change over the past three years. So initially it was we were brought in either in the middle of a crisis or we were brought in on uh, the beginning of, uh, of uh, trying to comply in this environment. So, but now what we're seeing is, is that, that that crisis mode is over. Um, now what we're doing is we're expanding um, the functionality within that. So I think initially it took uh, quite a bit longer. The implementation is, is crisper now. The integration of the application partners is better. We have hundreds of customers now that are doing it. So we have best practices defined. We have white papers uh, written. So in, in a short period of time, in less than three years, the time to uh, availability of data or time to functionality has been compacted significantly from something that could take, uh, you know, uh, a couple of months. Just migrating the content alone takes a long time. So, is it are you migrating the content, or are you uh, using, uh, or are you just capturing newly created content for it? Yeah. No. So, and to take a different spin on the question, just thinking about Sentara as a business, each one of these regulated markets that you go into as a business, it's like a startup. So, when you start off in the SEC world. You, and 17A4, you had to build trust, you had to understand what the regulations were, you had to get the first few customers using it. There's kind of a trust um, that develops within key people within the market, both on the regulatory side as well as at the customer site. And then you sort of hit a spot where you're, um, you sort of get past the early adopters and into mainstream buyers. And every time you go into a new market, a new regulated area, you have to go through that cycle of trust with the early adopters and then the mainstream folks uh, over and over again. So we see that as well. So healthcare, same thing. As you look at like FERC regulations in the power industry or Sarbanes-Oxley, you go through the same kind of cycle of trust. And those are newer. SEC and healthcare are much more mature for us. Yeah, I see something that seems somewhat mutually um, exclusive. Corey talked about using IT to a competitive advantage, and that's what a lot of the broker dealers do. I mean, they, they rely upon their IT infrastructure to, to provide them with that. Yet, uh, even though they do that, they are very willing to share best practices across. So I thought that was kind of funny that you would think that that would be the best practice, or that you would think that their competitive weapon would be proprietary and therefore confidential. Yet, in something like this is they don't want to be the only ones out there doing it. So what they're, doing, they're, what they're willing to do is share that and say, hey, everybody else is doing it come on along. 
so it was it was kind of funny, and uh, I, I thought that was odd that it, it, it clearly is they invest in IT for competitive advantage that they share. So for those of you that are familiar with like Jeffrey Morse crossing the chasm model, that's exactly what Tom's hitting on the early adopters that go share with each other, right at the beginning of this, and then that builds it out into something that's accepted within the industry, and it takes a long time to do that. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes months, maybe even a couple of years. We have time for one more question. Although I see lots of hands. <laughs> Carl. Um, I got a question about uh, security. I hope to know your perspectives from both the user and the regulators on the uh, vendor and the regulators on the security. Because uh, most of your products in the EU is involved in networking. And apparently, networking is associated with uh, security risks. And uh, what's your estimate about this issue of how big it is? <laughs> so I'll give our perspective. So it's incredibly important and serious. Um, with our the storage archive that we sell is typically behind a firewall, and so the front line of confronting that security problem is done by the folks at the firewall. You know the networking security folks, the Cisco's, the Nortels of the world, and the startups right out trying to solve this problem. It's incredibly important to them. Um, and how does it bleed over to us? Two ways. One, actually one of the emerging markets for us is all the logs that are being generated out of these security and firewall products. You have to keep that information for a long time to prove that you've uh, protected your networks and what kind of intrusions have occurred. A lot of data, that's the fact that we see a lot of data means they're spending a lot of money on the infrastructure products to do that. The other area where we see it is um, sometimes people ask questions about our infrastructure too as a second layer of defense from a security point of view. One of the things that comes up is hashing. So one of the ways to access our device uh, is, is a constant address, or the way to access it really is with a constant address and it has a hash in it. That hash, the MD5 algorithm is used in security applications for people that are using security fobs, things like that, because we happen to use that technology in a different way we do get questions about it, and it shows how important it is to people. So there's a lot of spending going on there at the time. There's a lot of startups and large companies playing in the space, so if you're thinking about starting a company, pick wisely, but it's a big space. From, from a user perspective, um, it, is, it is a big issue, but it's, it's in essence become a business norm. Right? You, build, you build those, those security functions in. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time for this part of Tech Day, but I'd like to sincerely thank all of our panelists for giving up their time this afternoon. Thank you.